I do have a little bit of that. I'm going to kick the damn door in whether you like it or not about <laughs> this, but I kind of just came in and was like, look, my name's Jacob Bryant. I'm here to sing, you know, and sometimes they were like, are you on the list? I was like, I don't know, but I am now. So there we go. You know? Appreciate you doing this. <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Of course. Um, I'm Adam, by the way, and this is about you and your journey in music. And of course, we'll talk about the new record. Awesome, man. Thanks for having me. Of course. Of course. Uh, I did see you're in Nashville now. Are you born and raised in Nashville? No, I'm uh, LJ, Georgia. I got a place down here um, where I'm at currently. But yeah, I go oh. back and forth. I go back and forth to Nashville uh, weekly. So. Oh, so you don't live in Nashville then? N not anymore. I did for two years, but I. Uh, oh, okay. I'm a, I'm a old red dirt mountain boy so i like living in the woods <laughs> <laughs> right i was just asking because i'm i'm new to nashville we've lived here uh, almost a year at the end of the month nice. it'll be a year so nice love it here it's awesome but very cool so if you're from alabama is that you said georgia north georgia, georgia sorry <laughs> Where, tell me about growing up in in georgia man uh nothing to do really other than play music and sit around a bonfire and drink beer and hang out with your buddies. I mean, that was kind of the, uh, the upbringing through high school and college. And, um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of it. It's out in the middle of nowhere kind of living. So I enjoy it though. It's a slower pace of life. Sure. Sure. That's awesome. <laughs> you went to college out there too. Is that what you said? Yeah, I, I went to uh Coosa Valley tech. I actually was starting to do, uh, I wanted to be a crime scene investigator is what I went to, to college. Oh, wow. That'd be uh, a rad uh, gig. Yeah, yeah. I guess I watched too much CSI or something, but um, yeah, I, I decided that playing guitar was a, a little bit more fun. So. For sure, for sure. When did you learn guitar, and was that the first instrument you learned? Um, I did a little bit of two things. I mean, I started on drums, but guitar is kind of what I gravitated toward at around the age of eight. So. Okay. How old were you when you started on drums? Uh, I, I was around eight too, but oh, I, okay. I, I guess I I kind of just gravitated more toward the guitar okay do you have music in your family like parents uh, musicians uh yeah yeah i mean in my family yes my parents weren't my grandparents had a bluegrass band growing up and oh, wow. it was uh it was super ingrained in me from from an early age on, on that end but yeah yeah i mean it, it was kind of a little bit of everywhere that's cool did they like that was their gig like they toured around and everything as the bluegrass band, they, they did like fairs and festivals and things like that. I mean, they weren't they weren't doing it for a living or or anything like I'm doing now. But it it uh at the time, I guess I thought they were uh, superheroes or something because you would have you would have thought they were playing an arena just being on the front porch to me, being a little kid and not knowing any better. But it um it was super cool growing up with it around for sure. Yeah, would you go see them play the festivals and fairs and stuff? No, not so okay. much. Um, Mainly in the front yard. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> pretty much. It, it was pretty podunk. We just sat on the porch and everybody hooped and hollered and and I had a good old redneck time, man. There you go. Did it? Is that what in, uh, influenced you into playing guitar or or drums at all? Like, did they have any impact on that? Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I I of course, like any kid, want to be like your dad or your mom or your grandparents or, or whatever, mm -hmm. but um yeah I, I definitely looked up to the aunts and uncles that played and, and grandparents and things of that nature very cool and when you were eight and you just like you wanted to play drums or guitar was that something that you your parents like were like oh yeah let's let's do it let's get you a guitar or you know was that something you really wanted to take seriously at that early of an age uh i don't know about seriously i mean it was just something i took interest in um i, I think it was probably I don't know, age 15, 16, before I really decided, okay, this is kind of something I really want to try to do and um, do something more than just play in the local pub or something okay, <laughs> and, and and go from there. But, but yeah, I mean, it, they definitely were supportive and whatnot, but they never pushed me to do it. Um, okay. 15 is when you started to, or thought you wanted to take it more seriously. Then you were playing in pubs and everything prior to that. Yeah. I mean, uh, I was in a praise and worship group at my oh, church okay. and uh, that was kind of the first time I really stood on stage in front of a crowd. And then I started doing like open mic nights and um, just like I said, local bars, local pubs. Um, 
and the local country venues and, and whatnot opening for other artists and it just kind of evolved from there throughout my teens were you writing songs that early on as well or were you doing mainly covers <laughs> yeah that they sucked but yeah well <laughs> <laughs> but you were that's cool though i mean to get up there and play your own songs that takes a lot of courage yeah, I, I guess I, I failed chorus in high school because I was too shy to sing in front of people. And then somehow I ended up singing for a living. So <laughs> kind of a crazy story. That's funny. I think I saw that. Uh, was it Jim Morrison, like got a D in chorus or something like that growing up too? Oh, like, it's just like, yeah, it's just funny to think back at stuff yeah. like that. But um, so you're writing songs, you're mainly playing just as a solo artist. Yeah. Aside I mean, from the church group. Back then, yeah, I mean, it was acoustic stuff mostly. Um, and then now, like I said, it's evolved into the smoke show that it is now with the the band and the mm -hmm. lights and all the glitz and glam and what George Strait would call the dancing chicken show uh, in pure <laughs> country. But but yeah, I mean, it's 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 became something kind of really high energy and and super fun. Sure. Once uh, you like at fifteen, when you decide like this is something I want to take seriously, uh, how do you? like go about trying to to achieve that aside from playing the clubs and you know different places around town like how did it get to like now I'm going to Nashville to record a record or man I, there was really no rhyme or reason at that time I was just a dumb young kid chasing a weird dream and wherever it took me it took me okay was there a moment that changed that for you I mean if you're in college going to become a you know crime scene investigator what'd you say uh, whatever yeah and like now you're a musician there must have been a turning point yeah i mean it, my mom passed in 2010 when i was 19 um on new year's day and i think that was kind of when i was like all right i'm gonna make something of this because it was more so her dream i guess than it was my dream um and once she passed it was kind of one of those like damn it i'm gonna do it for mama moments you know so Oh, I, uh, ever ever since then i guess since 2010 that day um even through the morning of it all and whatever i kind of put a fire under myself and and told myself all right there's no plan b if you give yourself a plan b you're only setting yourself up to fail because you're already giving yourself an excuse so my plan a was music and here we are wow and so at 19 did you continue going to school or at that point you're like i'm no i'm gonna just start doing this oh, no i uh I unfortunately dropped out um, of college like right before my associates. I wish I would have got it, but I um I, I always just, go back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, well, like I said, I don't believe in plan B, so I, I'm gonna stick with this thing. It's doing pretty yeah, good. Yeah, I was gonna say you don't really need to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so that's when you really start going for it. And how do you be even begin that journey? Is it okay? Wait, I got to play more shows at these local pubs. I've got to get a song out, like. How do you like? How do you even navigate that? Yeah, I, I think a lot of it then was just writing a lot. I started okay. writing a lot, trying to hone my craft there, and was listening to local Georgia guys like Corey Smith and Brantley Gilbert and Al Dean, and even some of the older ones like um, Alan Jackson and um, Almond Brothers and things like that to try to hone what I had, uh, what I had envisioned in my mind but um yeah i mean it it at that time was more so about the pen to paper part than mm -hmm. it was the playing out live and stuff that that kind of came um in between i guess 21 and 25 is when i really started kind of playing out a lot more and doing more touring and things of that nature okay okay and did i also see like at 19 did you have a heart attack at 19 yeah <laughs> oh my gosh now I'm, I'm putting it back together like okay your mom passed away and then that happens like what a lot going on there at 19 i mean to have a heart yeah attack. well it, it wasn't it wasn't um natural causes it was uh sorry red bull but don't ever drink red bull um i i had one too many red bulls working a night shift job at a concrete plant um and it literally was a chemically induced heart attack due to that stuff. So I, I haven't had caffeine since 2009 because of that. Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. That's unbelievable. I mean, it's obviously that's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. The doctor wow. told me I was lucky that there, there was unfortunately a young gentleman that passed away the night before for the exact same reason. And 
luckily my heart didn't explode um but yeah. from from red bull or from an energy drink oh my well, gosh i i had i had six of them in two hours so that's absolutely in excess so i'm not not saying i wasn't an idiot at the time but it's also one of those like a if it'll do that to you, I don't think you need it in you at all. So, right. No. Wow. But it, I mean, nowadays they sell like the Red Bull that's like 90 ounces. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's yeah. probably equivalent to six of them. And if you just sat there and slammed it, I can't whoa. even imagine. Like I said, I've, I've had caffeine in 12 years now or almost 13 years. So it, it would be, uh, it would be one of those, uh, I'd probably be jittery and acting like I was cracked out of my mind or something. Sure. <laughs> I even had a Coca-Cola. So, Oh my goodness, man. Wow. And uh, so <laughs> like out of that, I mean, you decided, I mean, I don't, I'm sorry to ask this, but did that happen prior to your mom passing away or after? Yeah. Yeah. That was right before she passed. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So that happens and your mom passed away and then it's just like, okay, I got to, I'm focusing hundred percent on this music thing. Mm -hmm. did you have a lot i'm sure you had a lot of <laughs> things to get out a lot of uh words ready to you know lyrics right ready to go oh yeah yeah <laughs> I've, I've, I've always been the type to write about what i feel so there, there's been a couple um uh, songs i guess that have maybe gotten me in trouble over the years that that were a little bit risque here and there but i like to write about real stuff man and um, mm -hmm. from addiction to being a little bit of a hellraiser and a whore dog in the bar scene and, and living life more than one year at a time. And it's, uh, it, it's a part of my life, you know, some parts of it, I'm not proud of, but I'm also one of them people that I do understand that everything happens for a reason. And I was supposed to be in that moment at that time. And now it made me who I am. So I'm not ashamed of any of it. That's great. Um, with, with that, like when you're writing these songs and you have some stuff together, do you, when do you start recording, uh, for the first time? um recording i mean I, I was even recording in my bedroom when i was a teenager oh, really stuff, okay but, but, I, but i didn't really i guess release anything outside of like uploading it on myspace you know how it used to have the little music player on myspace and oh stuff. yeah um i had put some stuff up like that with just me and a guitar but um as far as like full band recording i started working with a lady named bridget tatum in nashville like around that time that mom passed and um she wrote she's country for jason aldean and oh wow a couple other huge hits under her belt but started writing with her and danny myrick and some some really heavy hitters at that time as far as the songwriting world and country music and we started recording a little bit around that time i would say probably around 2012 how did you get into contact with them super random just uh playing little songwriter stuff in Nashville and just so happen to meet people through friends of friends. And it's definitely one of those, uh, mingling type towns. You never know who you're going to run into. And, and luckily I did, you know, meet her and have stayed friends ever since. So, so you were traveling to Nashville. Did you just know Nashville is where you wanted to be or the scene was there? Is that what kind of took you up there to, to, you know, join these writers rounds and, and be kind of in that scene? Kind of. Yeah. I mean, I, I knew it was something I needed to do. It was also something I was super scared of. I mean, like I said, I grew up in a super small podunk little town on a three mile dirt road. I mean, I, we didn't even get a Walmart until I was almost 20 years old. So oh, wow. it, it was, a uh, it was kind of a culture shock, but it, it was something I definitely knew I needed to get into and, and be there and, uh, be present. You know, you, you can't win if, if you ain't in the race kind of thing. So, um, I decided to start going and just kind of inching my way in slowly. Mm -hmm. How did like cutting in for anyone that's listening? That's like, okay, I'm in wherever I'm in Georgia. And I want to, I want to start to try to do this. I'm 19 and I want to, uh, how did Jacob do this going into Nashville? Like, how do you even just like, did you just try to throw your hat in the ring as far as like a writing round went? Like, how did you even get in these rooms or in the, in the door? Um, even though I was kind of shy growing up, I, I do have a little bit of that. I'm going to kick the damn door in, whether you like it or not about <laughs> this, but I kind of just came in and was like, look, my name's Jacob Bryant. I'm here to sing, you know, and sometimes they were like, were you on the list? I was like, I don't know, but I am now. So there we go. You know, oh, so. wow. Okay. So you really just had to be forward about it. <laughs> well, a little bit, you know, and of course that comes across as a dumb, arrogant, cocky kid, you know, but that's some of the ways that I met some of the people I did. And then, of course, now I look back and I'm like, Oh my Lord, you're an idiot. But it, uh, 
<laughs> it got me into some of the situations that I'm in now. So I'm, I'm like I said, I'm not, I'm not uh, proud of everything I've done, but I'm also not ashamed of it either. Sure. Didn't Michael Jordan say like you miss 100 percent of the shots you don't take or something like that? Pretty something. much, man. I mean, <laughs> like I said, you got to be present to win. You can't be scared to at least try. All they can say is no. So right, right. So once you start these writing sessions and, and you're 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 writing with these people that have these huge hits under their belt, like what what happens next? Man, just more writing. Um, wrote a lot with them, and you know, of course, met new writers through that and co-writes and continue writing and. Here we are. Right, like when did <laughs> I mean, it was there must have been like a, a victory point in that, like to kept you going. Were there just little victories on the, along the way that kept you driving at it? Or, I mean, I would imagine if you were just like writing and writing, and writing, and writing, and writing for years and nothing's happening, it's like, okay, how do I like what, what was the yeah. milestone? Yeah, I mean, I got I got a big cut with Luke Combs early on. Um, Luke and I wrote a song before he released Hurricane and kind of blew up on his own and whatnot but we wrote a song called out there together and it ended up being the first track on his first major label record that i think now is like triple platinum or something but um that was kind of i guess my first milestone as a writer um mm -hmm. where i kind of where i get a plaque on the wall and stuff like that and yeah and whatnot so that that one was definitely a milestone but outside of that i mean i've pretty much just wrote for my my own projects outside of um what luke's cut um and just a couple other like red dirt Texas, Texas artists and, and indie artists and things of that nature. Okay. And you had a, he, I mean, I'm look, just looking at your Spotify, pour whiskey on my grave is a massive song. I mean, tens of millions of plays on that song solely. Like when that hit, like, was that something that happened like quickly or like, do you remember that moment? Yeah, I mean, that one, that one was before like things like Facebook and Instagram had this whole algorithm where it, basically squashes you if you're not spending money for people to see your stuff and right you know, right all, all that mess so like yeah poor whiskey got like 21 million views in just like a couple of days on on facebook when we uploaded it there um and then of course as time goes by facebook's algorithms change and whatever so now even having 300 and something thousand fans on facebook i can post something and it'll only get like 20 likes because facebook doesn't let any of my fans see my stuff so I'm not. It's just so a, bizarre. It's I'm not so huge, bizarre. I'm not a huge fan of Facebook, if you can't tell. But right, right. <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, but yeah, I mean, some of that stuff was extremely overwhelming. I mean, we we did poor whiskey that went viral over 20 million, and then this side of sober went viral over 21 million um, on Facebook, and then YouTube, of course, did great. Spotify did great, and mm -hmm. uh, it's it's just some of those songs that really connect with people, and people start sharing it, and before you know it, it's it's doing its own thing, I guess, in, in the world of what we call viral now, um, the word of mouth grassroots style. Um, and that was kind of what my whole entire career has been based on is just, you know, fan base geared songs that, that I think at least somebody else will, you know, be able to gravitate toward or, or take something from that helps them and would make them want to show it to somebody else. Cause even your first EP does really, I mean, did really well. Right. I mean, the, the, a lot of the songs are still have millions of streams on them as well. Yeah, I think that one um, was my my debut thing, the self title one. I think it debuted like in the top five on iTunes charts or something like that, which was really cool. And then uh, the record that has Poor Whiskey on it was my first number one charting um, record as an indie. So it charted at number one on iTunes and I think like number 11 on Billboard, even without any radio airplay or anything. So that's so massive. Like that, what, a, I mean, just even the first one doing that well, right? I mean, what a validating moment. So you didn't have a record label or anything. You just put it out and people just ended up finding it and more people started listening to it. I mean, for it to yeah. grow like that on iTunes, I mean, that record came out 2014, which was like the height of, mm -hmm. if you had a song charting on iTunes, that was unbelievable. Yeah. 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 We did well back in that day. It, it, and that's what's crazy now in the world of streaming, you know, you never really know how a record's doing, you know, because you get these monthly reports and, and whatever in the streaming world versus before it was just, you know, dollar 29 per song or, you know, whatever, 12 bucks for the record or whatever. So you knew what you were kind of dealing with, but the, the new age is something I'm kind of trying to still learn how to wrap my head around and, and get behind but I, I do appreciate also the the other aspect of streaming is you have these curated playlists and um 
ways to put your music in front of people that may or may not have heard it before. And, and that's also like a huge pro in the streaming world. So I'm, I'm not one of those like super big haters of the streaming stuff like a lot of artists are because I, I also understand that, yes, you're making a little bit less money um, for your streams, but you're also getting put in front of way more people than you would have if you were just selling it as, you know, a hard copy record or a digital download or, or whatever. So I think there's there's enough pro there to uh, to outweigh the cons as far as streaming. So I'm, I'm excited to be partnered up with Spotify and Apple yeah. Music and a lot of these guys that are that are putting my stuff out now. Yeah, it's crazy to think like, I mean, you said the that song made it to number one without having any radio play. And it's like nowadays, I, I come from radio. I did radio for 15 plus years. And just to see the change even over the past like three or four years, how you don't need <laughs> necessarily need, I mean, I'm sure it helps obviously, but to even go number one without having any airplay is pretty incredible. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's fairly unheard of. I mean, that, that was one of the bigger ones for us. Um, as you know, I mean, if you don't have Sirius XM behind you or Spotify or Apple or Pandora or, or something like that now, I mean, yes, terrestrial radio is great and it definitely is a necessity, but I do think that, you know, if you have that organic built foundation behind you, um, you know, these streaming services and things of that nature will push you way, way further, I guess, than the old school way of, you know, the radio tour and things, mm -hmm. things like that. You've been at it for a, a long time. I mean, you put out a bunch of records between 2014 and then obviously the one with Poor Whiskey went nuts. So if you didn't have a back catalog and a fan base, I feel like something like a viral moment could just come and go, right? I mean, you have obviously have the back catalog of amazing songs and other songs on that record that people were gravitating towards after the fact. Like, yeah, I mean, I, I, I thoroughly believe in building the foundation. I mean, I, I know it is super cliche, but I, I grew up building houses. That was one of my first jobs. And, you know, you can build a house on top of dirt. That's all fine and good. But the first flood that comes, the house is going with it. You know, so if you don't, if you don't build a foundation under you with, you know, brick and mortar or concrete and rebar or, wh or whatever you do, um, you know, that house is going to go away, you know? So mm -hmm. I, I believe that's the same thing with fast up, fast down. You know, you can have somebody have a viral TikTok and they'll be the biggest thing in the world for three weeks. And then, after that, you know, you don't hear them anymore, you know? So I, I think it, it, it matters to get out there and play the crappy gigs in front of 15 people and then go back to that venue and build it to a hundred people and then to 500 people and, you know, whatever, and, and really grassroots the hell out of it until you build something that I would consider your foundation. And then from there, you can take that to somebody like a 30 tigers where I ended up or, you know, whatever, and let them help you enhance what you've already built and go up from there. And that way, there's no way for anybody to fail because you've built something that nothing can fall through, you know? Sure. No, that makes a lot of sense. And and I think that's happening a, a lot more now with the viral moments and these TikTok, yeah. you know, things happening where an artist will put that out and then it, it goes pff, like out of nowhere. And then it's, do I trying to chase that same song. Like, okay, I'm going to just keep writing something that sounds like that to hope that it does again. And then if it doesn't, and there's no foundation, like you just said right. there, then it's, they're just washed away and, oh, oh yeah, that one person had that one song that was popular that one time or yeah. that, yeah, that one hit. And you're, I don't even remember their name, but I, I remember the song or like one of those situations. Um, with that first uh, EP, the self-titled EP charting on iTunes, did that change stuff for you as far as like we're, managers hitting you up or able to get on the road with bigger artists like how, how did that affect your career at all um no not really um oh, the okay. first the, the first one was just me and my manager jeff kind of doing everything ourselves, and then even the next two like we did the through the windshield record and the up mm -hmm. and smoke record which were five song eps but um i don't think anything really like popped off as far as hearing from the industry folks until we uh until we released that uh, practice what I preach full length album. That was when people started really taking notice and they, they see a guy that, you know, has no record label charting on billboard and, um, having a number one debut with that. And that that's what it came. Yeah. <laughs> that really grabbed the eyes of people. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Wow. Did, did like when you put that song up, did it just you said it had what 20 million views? Was it fast? I mean, you put it up and you're like, whoa, you you know, the next morning you look at it and it's got X million plays. Yeah, I mean it the 21 million didn't come, of course, for you know a week or so. But yeah, I mean it's I, we I think we were like two or three million within 24 hours or something like that. And that is it, so it was one of those where like you just refreshed the page and every time it was going up by like twenty thousand or something. And I know, I know we ended up getting like 220 something thousand shares, which was even more incredible to me because 220,000 people not only watched it, but they wanted to send it to whoever their friends were too. So that, that was kind of crazy. You know, 220,000 yeah. people is a lot of folks to at least take initiative and actually click it, you know, right? much less click it, just share it, you know. So to so that, share it. And then their, their reach of fans, I mean, friends, I mean, hundred plus probably per person right and then it's just like and it just spreads it's crazy how it all works yeah it, it was it was incredible man i i was telling people if, if i had one cent for every view on that i'd, I'd be doing all right right now but, <laughs> but uh, i think spotify pays like a point zero like three of a percent of a cent <laughs> like a stream yeah, or something like I, that crazy I, don't need, I don't even look anymore man. I, just, I, just let, I just let it be let it be i like that uh well let's talk about your new record barstool preacher i love the video you did of you buying your own cd mm. that was pretty good <laughs> yeah, that, that, that was my first time doing that um we went into walmart you know because walmart has a vinyl section and stuff now because vinyl's kind of coming back and unfortunately the vinyl stuff was either sold out or they didn't have it one of the two but um we went down the street to an actual record store and their vinyls were sold out but they did have a couple cds left and i, I bought a couple and then actually left one at a nearby bar that was in buckhead georgia and uh, we came back a couple of days later and a fan had found it. So that's pretty cool. I don't know who the fan is cause they didn't send me a message, but some, somebody got it. So. <laughs> that's cool. That's really, really cool. Was this record written? Like, tell me where you were when, uh, the pandemic happened. I mean, obviously we're at like two years in now, but, uh, like, was this songs that came from that era or did you have a lot, like anything like other thing that went on and then it was like, okay, let's focus on this record now. Yeah, I mean, some of it was definitely that. I mean, the pandemic affected everybody. I mean, we went from 140 shows a year to practically none. I mean, I think mm -hmm. we did maybe 12 shows or something like that in 2020. So it was wow. pathetic. But, but um, yeah, I mean, a lot of those were were songs that I had either written during that time or you know previously written that didn't make the first record or or whatever. And then some of them like buzzards and a couple of those that Wyatt McCubbin had written that I, were outside songs that I decided to cut were just songs that I felt like that, you know, were something I wish I would have written, you know, and it, it, they were too good for me not to cut. So I, uh, I, I chose to do that. And we ended up, I think we cut close to 30 songs and ended up picking 13. So. Wow. Wow. That's I, I didn't realize that. So you, you, you people will pitch you still pitch you songs or you'll just know friends of friends that will you'll hear them and be like, oh, hey, I'd like I'd, I'd love to record this. Yeah, a little bit of both. I mean, I, I have songwriting buddies that will send me something like, hey, man, what do you think of this? Or, you know, check out this new demo we did and whatever. And then sometimes I have to beg them to let me cut it because it was <laughs> so good. They wanted it. But it's a uh, excuse me. I didn't get to no sleep worries. a whole lot last night. I got I got a two year old. Uh, toddler that's uh getting used to not having a passy so she, she kept uh, oh congratulations last night and, i have a five-year-old i remember those days man <laughs> yeah I, I have the uh i have an eight-month-old son and a two-year-old daughter so we had them back to back so our, our uh our sleep schedule is a little crazy <laughs> wow well, congratulations congratulations you. do you bring them on tour with you sometimes yeah they're gonna come to the opry with us oh rad that is rad you play. You're playing the Opry coming up, correct? February 18th. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And have you ever played there before? I have not. This will be my debut. Wow. I mean, that must be like you must be super excited. I mean, talk about an iconic place, and of course in Nashville, yeah. where you're coming up to record records. <laughs> That's one of those where I think that may be why I haven't been able to sleep. <laughs> I, I'm just kind of ready to to do it and enjoy it and get it over with because I'm like worried about what I'm going to do wrong and and whatever but it, at the same time i also have to understand that it's it is you know just a gig and everything's gonna be all right mm -hmm. i love it well i really really appreciate your time jacob this has been awesome thank you so much for for chatting with me about your new record and telling me your story 
Absolutely, brother. I appreciate your time and, and, and hopefully we can uh, get together over a, uh, a brewski or something on down the line and maybe i won't be falling asleep <laughs> i love that i would love that i would love that <laughs> if you're I, like i said i'm up here so if, if you come pretty if you come up here often enough dude i would love to i would love to, yeah. to hang yeah get my number from Haley or scott or whoever was my my press contact and, and cool. shoot, shoot me a text man next yeah. time i'm up we'll we'll touch base Cool. I have one more quick question for you, if you don't mind. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I want to know if you've already kind of answered this question throughout the whole conversation, but I want to know if you have any advice for aspiring artists. Write your own songs, man. That's, that's the best advice that I was ever given. Um, you know, like I said, growing up uh, hearing guys like Brantley and Corey Smith and all these young troubadours that, that really just had a, a natural hand at writing was something that didn't come as easy for me that I had to learn, you know, and, um, I would just say, be yourself, write your own stuff, because at the end of the day, nobody wants another Brantley or another, you know, Corey Smith or another Alan Jackson. They want a you, you know? So I, I, when I, once I finally figured out who I was and, you know, understood that, yes, I'll have similarities and things that I've pulled as influences from a lot of these artists that I cherish and looked up to and whatever. But at the same time, I stayed true to who I was and the sound that I have. And one of the greatest compliments that, you know, I get fairly often is, you know, nobody sounds like Jacob Bryant. You sound like you, you know, so that that's that's something I'm super proud of. So if if I can give anybody advice, that's what it would be. Bring it back,